thank you. Okay, then uh, welcome everyone. My name is Jakub Holi, and I would like to tell you why full crawl is awesome and why it's much easier to learn than you might believe. Uh, so we will look at what full crawl is and what it can do for you and why is it interesting. Then we will dig a little deeper into the principles it's based on and architecture and how, how it works actually and we'll look into how to learn it effectively and i will demonstrate some of the principles and tooling and finally we'll have discussion at the end and by the way i want to uh, thank those four people who came yesterday for my test drive this talk so uh, first of all uh, who is Jakub Holi? Uh, so i've been doing back-end development since 2006 and front-end development since 2014 on and off i'm originally from czech republic uh, living currently in oslo norway and i work as a team lead and back-end developer at uh, enterprise architecture documentation scale up called ardoc and in the evenings i built learning materials for full pro beginners and I pair program with and mentor my private clients on their first full core projects. And I enjoy martial arts and meditation and writing about software on my blog. And you can find me as Holy Yak in, in Closure and Slack and GitHub and other places. So why full crow? Uh, when I create web applications, I want to be productive and I want to have fun. I want to focus on what's important to the user. That's getting data from some data store and displaying them in a the UI. I don't want to waste time on having to manually extract data from a backend, uh, reshape them, store them somewhere, then pull them into the UI. I don't want to have to manually track whether the data started loading or finished or failed and i don't want to write tons of boilerplate and especially not to do that then again and again for every new type of data in my application and i don't want to be forced to use text search to find relevant parts of my code that come together to implement important behavior so that's why i love full crawl and want to tell you about it uh, now, there are simpler frameworks. There, there are frameworks that do just one thing, for example, view rendering. But when you create a real world application, you quickly discover that you need to do a number of things and that you need to work across both front end and back end. Thus, you have a choice. You can find a bunch of libraries and frameworks and try to fit and glue them together. Uh, or you can pick a full stack web framework that has all the parts you need that can solve all the common needs and make solving uncommon needs possible. And that has parts that fit together perfectly without any glue. And that enables you to pick and choose exactly the parts that make sense for your problem. So what's full crawl? It's a malleable web framework designed for sustainable development of real world full stack web applications. There's a lot in this sentence, so let's unpack this. Let's start from the bottom. So real world applications means that we have some general data store and we want to get some data out of it, typically just a small subset of the data it has. We need to shape the data into the form that the UI needs, then we want to transfer it over to the front end, cache it there, display it to the user. We also want to be able to change this data in the same way. And most likely we also want to track status of operations. We need to deal with errors. Yeah, that was nice about it. For the sustainable development, uh, it means that as our applications grow in size and in age, the complexity of the application and thus the cost of change doesn't skyrocket. 
which means that we need to be very careful with complexity and with boilerplate code. And finally, malleable means that uh, Fulcro is not big black magic box, but it's a small set of principles turned into code uh, with hooks for modifying or overriding essentially any of its important behaviors as long as you are aligned with the overall philosophy of the, of the framework. Uh, Tony Kay, the author of Fulcro, had an excellent talk here uh, not long time ago, which I highly recommend. And he essentially describes how Fulcro came to be and talks about the problems with uh, the development of web applications and with making the development sustainable. So I highly, highly recommend that you go and see the talk, even if you are not interested in, in Fulcro itself. That would be surprise me why you would be here and here. But it, even so, it's it's worth listening to. So why Fulcro? What, what does it provide to you as a developer of web applications? <clears throat> Sorry. First of all, I would like to quote Denis Boudinot, a freelance full stack developer who wrote, I'm positively surprised, almost shocked, not only because it, meaning full crow, seems to be very carefully crafted and designed, but also because it manifests several concepts, practices, and intuitions that I have been using and gathering, and again, then goes way beyond that by refining and composing them into a whole adaptable system. I so far feel blessed and lucky because Fulcro validates my half-baked tools, ideas, and practices, but also because it seems to be a framework that I can build on with confidence. I really like this quote because it resonates a lot with what I think. So on to the point, what can Fulcro do for you? So it can uh, render data in the UI uh, and it uses React, so it wraps React for that. Uh, full core components are React components. It can manage state, meaning that it keeps the state for you at some place. It makes it easy to change that state. And when it's changed, it also uh, re renders the UI so it reflects the latest data. It makes it easy to load data from the backend. Tawi doesn't load the data for you, it's you who do that, and you have full control. And thus, you can also decide which data you want to load at once when the application is starting, uh, which data you want to just trigger loading, but not necessarily wait for them, or which data you want to load on demand, for example, when the user clicks a button. And you can also get information about whether the loading started or finished or failed. When data is loaded, so Fulcro also caches the data for you automatically. And it does so, uh, it caches them in normalized form, which we will explore later. And the uh, final point I want to highlight here is uh, that Fulcro has excellent developer experience mm -hmm. for multiple reasons. One of them is locality and navigability, meaning that information in Fulcro is quite concentrated. So to understand the behavior of UI, you don't need to jump across multiple files. And if there is something that's not right there and you actually need to jump to it, so you can just use the code navigation in your editor to jump to that place and, and then come back. You don't need to search through text. Uh, next, it has excellent uh, integration with the REPL. Well, essentially anything that uh, the user can do in the application or that Fulcro itself is doing uh, is easily accessible as REPL functions. So we spent much more time in the REPL when troubleshooting our applications than clicking around in the UI, uh, which is much more proactive. And finally, it has a really good browser tooling that enables you to see the state of the application and its history. There are some other things Fulcro can do for you, uh, essentially mini libraries, uh, for example, for dealing with forms or routing uh, state machines and so on. 
but uh, we won't uh, speak about them now. And if you are new to full pro, you should actually ignore all of these things and just try to focus on the core and try to get that first. Well, full pro is based on a few simple principles uh, that enable all its power. So let's explore what those principles are. But first, an important disclaimer. Full crawl doesn't do any magic. It does some hard things for you, but its operation is quite straightforward and very much possible to understand. That's not so with all frameworks. Some of them are incomprehensible to an ordinary user. Some frameworks could be even set to deal in black magic, such as Spring in Java. You have no idea what's happening there. And it's awesome when they work, and you are completely lost when they don't. But it's not like that with full crawl. Full crawl, you can and you should try to understand how it works, at least at some elementary level. It will really pay off. So the principles that Fulcra is based on are these four. The first one is that we use Craft API instead of REST API, which means that we have just a single endpoint and it's the front end which asks the back end for what data it wants by sending over a query. But it's not a query like SQL query that searches for something. It's more like a template for data uh, in, in a tree form that the backend fills in. So I could ask, please give me all my friends. And for each one, I want their name and picture. I don't care about their birthday or other things. Uh, aside of sending over query and getting by, back a tree of data, you can also send mutations, which are requests for side effects, typically for changing data in the DB. Uh, there's an excellent talk by Will Caruccio that I uh, link to at the end of these slides, and you will have access to them, so you can find the link there. Uh, and it explains why Graph API is, in many cases, far better for the applications than REST APIs. And in particular, why the flavor of Graph API that we use is even better than the popular GraphQL. So the next principle uh, of FullPro is that UI is pure function of state. That means that, uh, oh, what is UI? It's essentially tree of components, right? I have this page and it contains some forms and the form contains a button. Right, so we have components that contain components. Yeah. So the rule here is that components only ever get the data they need from their parent. They don't go and fetch data on their own through some side channel, uh, which makes it much more straightforward and uh, easier to work with. Uh, yeah. The third principle is locality and i already mentioned it a little uh, that's the the, the thing that uh, right we are making web applications to interact with users right so the ui is the key part of that application and the core building block the most important part in the ui is are the ui components so to understand the ui component i shouldn't be forced to jump over four different files right I should have everything I need to understand it and its behavior right there. So in full crawl, a component doesn't have only a body that renders some HTML. It also has a configuration map with uh, configuration and data uh, for describing and then uh, configuring its behavior. And it's open map, so we can add your own stuff there to make your own extensions, uh, whatever. The most important part of this configuration is query, uh, where the component declares what kind of data, what data it needs to work. Uh, and it's essentially a fragment of the query that the, that we sent to the Craft API, and we'll see what it looks like. Uh, 
And uh, the query of a component also includes the queries of its child components and so on all the way up. So the query of the root component is essentially the query for all the data the whole page needs to be rendered. And then when the data comes in, so the root component takes whatever data it needs for itself and then passes parts of it down to its children and so on all the way down. So then the data is decomposed up to the leaf. Okay. And the final principle is normalized uh, data in state. So that the client side state uh, and cache where we store our stuff doesn't store the tree of data that we got from the backend, but it stores that data normalized in a simple tabular form where each data entity has a table and I put quotes around it because it's essentially not table, it's map, right? So each, each data entity has its own table slash map and where entities contain other entities in the original tree. So we replace those with references. This makes it much easier to find any piece of data. And also when you change a piece of data, the change will be reflected at all the places that use that piece of data. So it's really a really important thing. And again, we will see more of it later. So these are just few simple principles, but when you combine them, they make many things possible. And some of those things are some of the mini libraries in full crawl and uh, or other things as well. But I won't really go into this because Tony talks about the, the possibilities that this created in his talk. What I want to talk about is the architecture of full crawl. It's a full stack web framework, so it has the front end and back end part. Uh, on the front end, uh, I hope you can see my mouse. So we have the, the UI based on React, this tree of components. And we have client DB, which is the client side state with the normalized data. And finally, we have a this tax thing, which is a transactional subsystem. So essentially any side effect you want to trigger from a component is not executed it right away, but it's submitted essentially as a request for side effect to the transactional subsystem uh, that then executes it eventually. And it could be as simple as just updating some data in the client DB, or it could also send something over to the backend and maybe result in getting data back. And when the transaction is finished, full crow will get the data from the client DB and re-render our UI. So it's always kept fresh. Now we have the backend part. So the, the front end that's full crow proper. On the back end, we have uh, full cross twin library Pathom, which is essentially a library for writing craft APIs. And for you as developer, it just means that you write small functions that get small part of the query and return the corresponding data. Uh, Pathom typically reads from some general data store, like Postgres SQL or Datomic. It could also talk to a remote uh, REST APIs or multiple data sources. It essentially is kind of adapter between the tree of data that the UI wants and whatever data sources there are. So the, the front end sends over its EQL queries. EQL stands for Eden Query Language and mutations and typically gets back some tree of data. Uh, a small note here that uh, I talk a lot about root query, but that's not typically the query that we use to load data. We typically use some sub queries, and that's maybe that's too much of a detail now. But when we zoom in on the front end part and how rendering in full crow works, so here on the left side, we have a tree of component. Every square here represents a component uh, with root at the top and they have some children, some of them. And most of these components are stateful. That means they need data. 
and because they need data they have a query that uh, tells for, for they need data and the query for each component is represented by the yellow shape uh, the shapes are different because they are different components so they logically need different data and the queries are composed up so as i was uh, saying the components query includes the queries of its children as well so that the when full pro asks the root component for its query it gets query for the whole page we see that here you can see all the, the shapes are there and then full pro combines that query with the data in the client db in the front end state to make a tree of data and if you look carefully you see that the tree of data corresponds in shape to the query that came in and then full pro takes this tree of data and gives that to the root component and uh, tells it please go render yourself and then, then root uses whatever data it needs itself and passes subtrees to the children that have requested it so the data is decomposed down to the leaves so that's how rendering works in full uh, and here we can see how a full crop component looks in code full crop component is a react component as well uh, we created with the dfsc macro which means define stateful component we call it person Oops, sorry and each component gets two arguments a reference to itself and props that's the data it got from its parent uh, which is the data it needs to, to work then we have here the configuration map and the most important part here is the query so here the person component tells full pro that it needs person id person name and person pets to be able to render itself and it also tells that uh, it doesn't really care about uh, data inside pets it doesn't know what, what, what's needed there but it has a child component pet which cares about what information about pets we, we, we get so it includes its query here and then we have the body of the component which renders DOM and we use all the good functions for that uh which works very well and inside the body we can use the props extract the data from there to, to display them and we can map child components or yeah, render child components uh, passing them some subtrees of the data that we got in ourselves and yeah one more thing in the config we have also very often this ident thing which means identifier and it tells essentially full crow what is the primary key of this data entity called person uh, so that it, when it looks at the props it knows which property is the id so in this case it is the value of the person id which is the unique id of this thing which is used for the normalization of the data uh, now on to learning full crow so, uh, people have this assumption or belief that full crow is hard to learn but it's not and there are two main reasons why people think it is uh, the first one is that it has many features uh, those are the, these mini libraries and some some support for some corner cases but you don't need to learn them actually as a beginner you should actively avoid them it might be good to know that they exist but you should not try to learn them uh, and the second and perhaps bigger problem is that you need to rewire your brain learning full pro is like learning closure if you came from java you need to unlearn a set of assumptions that you bring in that do not apply here you need to really understand the principles they are simple but they are different from what you are used to and if you come in with uh, expecting that things just work the way you expect you will be running into a wall of your own making repeatedly and learning for chrome may seem overwhelming uh, the main resource is the full core developers guide which is excellent thing 
it uh, describes everything in great detail. But the problem with it is that it describes everything in great detail. So when you are learning something new, you don't want to start by learning, but memorizing the, the whole reference thingy, right? You want to have some resource which is made for you a beginner and tells you just what you need to know. And uh, as I was mentioning, there's a lot of things that you could learn, like form state management and routing and state machines and rapid application development, but you don't need to. And you should try to avoid these things for as long as possible. Then full pro is far less overwhelming than it might seem. And nowadays there are great resources for beginners. Uh, I am biased because uh, I have created uh, them with the help of community. Uh, but uh, even so, I think they are objectively awesome. Uh, so I would start with the do it yourself full pro workshop where in some two hours you get to actually play with the concepts that I have presented in practice and see how they work. And you also get to experience the awesome tooling that full pro has. So then when you start actually learning and working with full pro, you will be very well equipped. Uh, then there's this uh, minimalist full pro tutorial. It's not really minimalist in the sense of teaching you almost nothing. Uh, it's not hello world. It actually tries to teach you how to build full stack web application, but it tries to teach you the absolute minimum amount of things you need to know to be able to do that. So it's very yeah, much more digested and concentrated than, than the full core guide. And it has a company and full core exercises where you can play with code and verify your understanding of what we have learned in the tutorial. Uh, if we, I want to dig a little deeper in one thing, and that's uh, I, I claim that uh, full crow is fundamentally really simple. I guess you can't see my t-shirt. Maybe you can see it here, but it says that uh, essentially full crow might not be easy, but it's simple. So where does the simplicity come from? Uh, yeah. uh, the, I would like to highlight four sources of simplicity. The first one is the fact that we use Graph API with uh, data normalization, uh, which means again, that we have just a single endpoint and the data is cached and placed automatically for us. Uh, so all the manual data management that you would have with REST API, where you have to juggle multiple endpoints and massage data and put them somewhere, all that falls away. It's much shorter way from having some data in the backend to getting them displayed in a component in your UI. And there's also, uh, I think, good separation of responsibilities where in full crawl, it's the backend which is responsible to fit the data to what the UI needs, which makes the front end simpler, uh, which I think is really good because front ends are already complex. And uh, in my experience, working with data in the backend is just simpler than doing so in the front end. So I, I would call this kind of standardized input of data into our front-end application. The next source of simplicity is that the UI is pure function of data. Uh, we have discussed that already. So it's it, it makes it much more straightforward, right? You ask the root component for its query, you combine it with the data, get the data tree, pass it down to the UI, and the UI does its thing. It means that when you troubleshoot application in full crawl, something like 90, 95% of the time, you don't mess up with the UI. You just look at the data. What's wrong there? Have I Am I missing some link in the data or, or where's the problem? So it means that you are troubleshooting your application at 
at least one level of complexity less than if you had to deal with the UI itself. So this pureness is really important. And another consequence of the pureness is that the life cycle of data and of side effects uh, does not depend on the life cycle of the UI and on rendering. And by definition, when things are separate, they are simpler than if they are inter intertwined. Right? Imagine the nightmare where you have some hierarchy of components that use React hooks for managing state and side effects. So they are inseparably intertwined with the life cycle uh, of, of the components and of their rendering. And then there might be some implicit dependencies between them and you can't really understand what's happening. And then if you by chance refactor the UI and move one of the components away uh, or some other place uh, and break this implicit dependency, it's just a nightmare to troubleshoot. We deal with data, which is so much simpler. The next point is that uh, all side effects in full pro go through the transactional subsystem, uh, which being submitted to it for processing, which gives us a single place for implementing cross-cutting concerns such as uh, performance monitoring, error handling, or if you want to have some specific strategy about how you deal with some kind of side effects which makes it much simpler than if you had to do this repeatedly manually for every kind of data or side effect in our application. So uh, it's kind of standardized output of side effects in our application. Standardization in this uh, sense is good because it means we end up with something simpler. And the final point I want to make is data. So query in, in Fulcro is data mutation the request for side effects is data we are getting data back we troubleshoot our application by looking at the data uh, it just makes it much simpler than if you have to work with the whole complexity of the of the ui so that was a lot of me talking let's have demo uh, time so here i have a simple full crow application uh showing a to-do list so let's let's look have a look what we have here uh, we have one root component which has one child called the to-do list and that child has three children of its own uh, which are to-do items if we look at the actually inspect proper so the, the question i have now okay where does the data in my application come from uh, to reload obviously Actually, let's let's make this more interesting so every side effects go through transaction subsystem so i should see data here and i do uh, that i see that we are loading them and actually in this case i know this is a remote transaction which goes over the network so i can also see it here and here i can also see the response and even better i actually want to have some I want to play with it and I want to have syntax highlighting on it so here on the left side we see the query that full cross sent to the backend to get data and I can translate that for you so we it's telling please give me the thing with list ID of one and for that thing what I want to get back is ID items title and filter and for each of the items i want its id and label and, and some other stuff right and here we see the data and we see that the data mirrors the query uh, i can also play with it. maybe i could have a look at at least number two and i guess i don't really care about id or filters and for the items i just want to see the label So if I run that, I get exactly the data that I have asked for. That's a part of how graph graph APIs work. You get what you ask for. And if I ask for something that doesn't exist, I get back empty data, maybe some errors, depending on what, what the thing is. So, okay, now we have seen uh, that the three 
of the components. We have seen uh, the query that we sent uh, and the data we get back. So we might want to know, okay, uh, where do we send the data, the, the query? I mean, wh when do we load the data? I can show you that. So here we have, a, in my application, I have a start function, which is hooked by Shadow CLJS when it builds application so that it will be called at the start. And in, in here, I call the full cross data fetch load to load data from the backend. I'm telling it, please load this thing with list ID one. And for the content of that thing, look at the query of the to-do list component. Uh, so we can look here, what is the query of the to-do list component? What does it want? And we can see it here. So to-do list component needs ID, title, filter, item. So that, that's what we saw in the query, right? So yes, we can see that the query really comes from here. We see it also has the sub query for the item stuff. And you might already guess that this comes from the child component, the, what was it called again? The to-do item. So we check that. Yes, it's asking for ID and label and complete and some other stuff that we did not see in the data because it doesn't exist yet or it's front end only. Okay, so we, we saw uh, the application is loading data at start. We saw what the, the query is, what the data is, where the query comes from. Now we might want to know, okay, where does the data end up? Um, for that, we can uh, first, let's have one more look at the code. Uh, when we load the data here, we add extra configuration. Uh, in this particular case, we are telling Fulcro, please, aside of putting the data where you would normally put it, also make a sim link to the data at the top of the client DB called root slash current list. So if you look at the data in the client DB, uh, it has two parts. One is these tables in quotes. We have one table for item, which has three items. And there's one table for lists. It is currently just a single list. And then it has other stuff. The important thing for us here is the root current list. That's the, the sim link that Fulcro, that we asked Fulcro to add. And you can see its value is referenced, it's pointer to the actual data. When I click here, you see that I come to the list table and the th list with ID one. And that's the list we expected, right? The, that's the, the list that we see here. And notice when we when the data came back from the backend, it was a tree of data, but here the items are not included. They are replaced with references again. And I can follow that up and I see I'm um, in the item table you can do I can decide you one and it's it's this one more thing so oh, that's why I'm watching so when I do some action in the UI it starts a transaction, submits a mutation to the transaction subsystem, which I can see here. And this looks like function call, but it's actually just data. It's a it's, uh, symbol and, and some, some data here. And in this case, again, this actually also go over to the network. So uh, it can be person database and I could Let's see, I could check item one again manually from here. Right, that succeeded, but nothing happened here. Because here I actually only send it to the back end, so the front end doesn't know it all. But if I reload, it's there. So that, that's it, essentially, uh, takeaways. I hope that you will take away with you that full stack frameworks are really useful 
and especially that fulcro is really worth looking into and learning is not hard if you are a little smart about it and here are some awesome resources especially the fulcro community guide where you find the workshop and tutorial and all the other 